Chapter 1. Unconscious Rebellion I've met my first girlfriend when I was in Israel. Her name was Faye, and it was no time at all before I was under her spell. She had long brown wavy hair, dark brown eyes and a huge smile that revealed cute dimples in her rosy cheeks. Our time together was short, but I still have fond memories of her and can clearly see her smiling face. I did my best to lose my virginity to her. However, a combination of my inexperience at that time and the time of the month meant that it never quite happened. All too soon she returned to England and I was left to grieve her absence. I left the kibbutz not long after and wandered around Israel for a while, spending much of my time in Jerusalem. One day, whilst I was in the old quarter of the city, I was approached by a man. He said that I looked a bit down on my luck and offered to buy me a meal at the nearby church. I guess I saw the world as quite a dangerous place at this time, but I decided that I would keep my wits about me and cautiously accepted his offer. True to his word, he bought me a meal that I enjoyed. He talked a little about his Christian faith, but he did not try to force anything on me. When I had finished eating, he shook my hand, wished me well, and was gone. I did not expect to ever see him again, and was surprised when we met again four years later. I was on a tube train in London, and the carriage was rather full. There was, however, one seat that was only occupied by a bag of onions. I asked the man who was sitting next to the onions if he would be kind enough to move them. As he looked up, I recognised him as the man who had bought me the meal in Jerusalem. He recognised me too, and we briefly exchanged pleasantries before the tube came to a stop and he left. Life is full of lessons when we open our eyes and ears and are receptive. Often the lessons are highlighted through synchronicity or meaningful chance encounters, also known as serendipity. I believe this experience was to challenge my view of the nature and motives of people. What were the chances of me meeting this man again? To be on that same tube as me, in that carriage, at that exact time with his bag of onions. Perhaps my second meeting with the onion man was to bring my awareness to the fact that there are many good people in the world, and regardless of my past experiences, I should be open to this possibility. When I returned from three months in Israel, where I discovered the world of alcohol, women and menial labour, I spent a while living in a flat in Wolverhampton. My brother's friends were introduced to me, and my initiation into the world of illegal drugs began. They were good days. The drugs worked splendidly. I was a rebel. I was free. I was doing exactly what I wanted to, which, just by coincidence, was exactly what my parents did not want me to be doing. There was a good alternative scene in Wolverhampton. Long evenings in pubs usually ended in even longer nights at friends' houses or impromptu parties, where the sole objective was to get as out of your face as possible. My friend Billy had an old Land Rover, and we would go away from Wolverhampton on camping weekends. It seemed mainly so that we could take drugs in alternative surroundings. After one particularly long afternoon in the pub, we all went back to my flat, and somehow a water fight ensued. The landlord was not impressed, nor were the tenants downstairs, who found they had large quantities of water running down their walls. I promptly found myself evicted. The obvious course of action was to move into my friend's flat, and as I had not developed any more constructive plans, I would stay there until it was time to take up my place at Sunderland Polytechnic. Unfortunately, my friend's place only had one bedroom, so my bed was in the kitchen. It was a large kitchen, and the arrangement worked well. My place at Sunderland Polytechnic did not last long. Within three months I had been evicted from the halls of residence for smoking cannabis. I moved into a shared house with another couple of dope smoking buddies, and pretty soon it was a rare occurrence for me to be attending lectures. The academic world was making little impression on me. By comparison, the continued use of cannabis, exploration of LSD and magic mushrooms was much more colourful. At this point, my parents were paying me an allowance on which to live, and I figured that instead of spending my dad's money, I may as well drop out properly from college and sign on to join the ever-increasing number of unemployed in the North East. Interestingly, my dad never thanked me for saving his money. I think the disappointment of me dropping out resulted in his failure to notice my concern for wasting his money. 
Drugs became my first true love in Sunderland, followed closely by a woman named Claire. She was a little older than me, had a car, was wild and was much more experienced in the bedroom department than I was. At the time, those factors were important to me. Early on in our relationship, things became tricky though. After the end of her previous relationship, her ex-boyfriend had decided to embark on a round-the-world trip on his motorbike. Sadly, a little into his adventure, he was knocked off his bike by a lorry in Egypt and died. As you can imagine, this had a massive impact on Claire and our relationship never really fully recovered. I struggled to understand and had little empathy for what she was going through. To make matters worse, I felt rejected by her inability to connect with me. Nevertheless, for the next couple of years we stayed together. Whilst based in Sunderland, every now and then I would go to London to do agency or labouring work to raise money for the debts I was accruing as a result of my love affair with cannabis. The drugs were good fun to begin with. There was a whole air of subversiveness and anarchy which surrounded the drug culture and the scene that went with it. An altered state of consciousness was quite a treat at first, but the problem with pretty much any drug is that before too long you don't get a buzz anymore, so you just need more and more to feel normal. It wasn't too long before this was the case for me, and smoking just became the norm, a way of life. I did a lot of hitchhiking back then, and enjoyed meeting new people who were kind enough to give me lifts. There were a few odd characters along the way, like the one man who insisted that I should come back to his place for the night, as there were two prostitutes he wanted to introduce me to. I managed to persuade him that, although the offer was very kind, I really needed to get to London as soon as possible. Another guy who gave me a lift was rather intent on touching himself, and when he suggested we pull over and masturbate, I let him know that we were stopping at the next services where I was getting out. What he did after that was up to him, and I hope he had a wonderful time. On the whole, though, most people who gave me lifts seemed to be pretty decent folk. In London, I would sleep on friends' floors or in squats and live frugally. The work was usually menial and mindless, and the details of each job are not clear now. I do remember one job, though, in particular. I had reported to the job agency as usual in the morning to see what treats they had in store for me. Bored to death by the recent work I had been assigned, I asked if they had anything a little different, and by chance on that day they did. Before long, I found myself in the operating theatre of a hospital. My job was to wheel the anaesthetised patients in and out of the operating theatre, move the lights for the surgeons and clean up the blood and bits after. After witnessing a couple of circumcision operations and nearly passing out on a number of occasions, I decided that this was definitely not a career path for me. The next morning I was pleased to be back in a warehouse doing mindless, boring tasks. On another occasion, a group of my friends and I went to London for a different reason. It was the day of the anti-poll tax demonstration. This peaceful demonstration soon developed into a full-blown riot with many casualties on both sides. It was terrifying to be in Trafalgar Square that day. It really was a battlefield. The police struggled against the anger of the uprising protesters, and anyone else for that matter who happened to have had a bit too much to drink on the day. Not being one for violence, I didn't hang about too long, although when we regrouped later, my friends told of the casualties they had inflicted on the enemy that day. I had developed quite a dislike for the police by this time, I guess I saw them as upholders of a system that I did not want to be a part of. They were an easy target for my scorn, and run-ins with them in the future further served to fuel my contempt. At that time, I was dressing in combat trousers, big baggy jumpers, ripped t-shirts, army boots, and sporting my first tattoo. My long blonde hair had been shaved at the sides. I had a mohawk top and long dreadlocks at the back. I stood out, and my message put politely was, I don't belong to your society and I reject your values. I looked intimidating, in the same way as a dog looks intimidating when its heckles are up because it has been cornered. On some unconscious level, I felt like life had cornered me. Although I didn't realise it at that time, I was fearful and the best way to keep people away was by my appearance. On the whole, it worked. Sunderland days continued in a drunken stoned haze. 
By this time I was dealing drugs to help support my habit, as one does. I had the odd run-in with other drug dealers who were not impressed by my reckless decision to start dealing on their patch, but it didn't bother me too much. I didn't care about anything except sorting out my next smoke, and I certainly didn't care about myself. My accommodation also reflected how I felt about myself, and the shared house I live in soon became a dump. There were smashed windows and broken doors. The upstairs sink in the hall became the men's toilet because we couldn't be bothered to go downstairs. We ripped the gas fire out to reveal an open fireplace, and pretty soon most of the landlord's furniture had been smashed up and burnt. In Sunderland, I began to learn about the deep human need for belonging, and for the first time I began to feel I belonged. All my friends took drugs, we wore similar clothes and had wild haircuts and listened to the same fuck-the-system sort of music. But deeper than this, I think there was a stronger unifying factor. Our appearance and preferences seemed to have been our own choices, but I now suspect that what really unified us and drove our actions was an innate lack of having our emotional needs met during our childhoods. The need for affection, support Encouragement, comfort and safety while growing up are fundamental to the development of a healthy human being. My friends were from diverse backgrounds, ranging from particularly working class to extremely upper class. Yet we were all united by our fragmentedness. Our solution to the gnawing emptiness within was to fill the hole with drugs and angry music and direct our anger and disappointment at a visible enemy, the government, and those whose role it was to maintain the status quo. I was doing what I needed to do. I'd found a sense of belonging and I was having experiences that were shaping the person I am now. Another experience that shaped me reminds me of how one little choice or decision leading to action can have such a massive impact on the way our lives unfold. It happened when I went to London to buy some cannabis. I'd bought quite a lot and was waiting at Victoria Coach Station to return north. Anybody with any sense would have made sure they turned up just in time for the bus to avoid hanging about with large quantities of illegal substances. But no, not me. As if arriving at the bus station early was not enough, I committed the ultimate drug traffic of faux pas by smoking a joint with a fellow traveller who I met at the station. Smoking drugs in public is not a good idea at the best of times, and whilst carrying large amounts of cannabis is a definite no-no. Anyway, I was young, reckless and stoned, and I didn't care. Things changed dramatically in an instant when a policeman arrived making his way down the line of people asking questions and looking at bus tickets. I was hit by an enormous wave of paranoia, but knew it would only draw attention to me if I were to leave at this point. So I waited my turn, trying desperately not to sweat profusely and forget the fact that I was sitting on enough drugs to put me in prison for a long time. When my turn came, I answered his questions about what I was up to, without telling the whole truth. I showed him my bus ticket and breathed a sigh of relief as the policeman walked away. I have never been so relieved to see a bus pull up as I was on that day. If the policeman had asked to search my bag, as was commonplace for a guy dressed like myself, the course of my life would have been altered incontrovertibly. In the past, when stopped by the police, I was able to swallow the small amount of legal substances I had on my person. This time I would have been chewing for a very long time. I made my way back to Sunderland with a wild tale of how I had stuck two fingers up at the capitalist state and her minions. How differently things could have turned out. On reflection, it seems plain to me now that every choice or decision we have ever made is linked to where we are today. And as a result, I now endeavour to act more consciously as I know, every decision or action I make today will impact on all of my tomorrows. Sometimes when I think back to all I've been through, it's a wonder I'm still here. One episode illustrates to me how important it was to numb my feelings with cannabis, even if it meant risking my life. On this particular day, I was again off in search of renewing my dwindling drug supplies. My friend and I went to Leeds on his motorbike, as there was nothing about in Sunderland. These temporary droughts were the bane of a dope smoker's life. My friend's name was Dick, and he considered himself a good mechanic. However, my experience was that he did most of his motorcycle journeys with the AA Relay Breakdown Service. 
He would often push his broken motorbike down the road and call the AA of which he was a member. He would tell them that he had broken down on his way somewhere. His motorbike would be winched onto the back of the truck and he would get a free ride to wherever he was going. He certainly did make the most of his AA membership. On this day, the engine of his little 125cc was working fine. The only fly in the ointment was that his lights were not. We set off reasonably early in the morning and felt we would easily be back before it was dark and the trip would be a breeze. Unfortunately, when we got to Leeds, the dealer who was supposed to be supplying the goods had nothing for sale and was awaiting a delivery. Total cannabis junkies that we were, we decided to wait a while. Needless to say, a while turned into a long while, and by the time the goods arrived, the light was fading. For some strange reason, we decided to make a dash for it anyway, knowing that there was no way we would get back to Sunderland before darkness fell. Sure enough, halfway up the M1 motorway, we found ourselves in complete darkness. In no time, and not really surprisingly, we were pulled over by the police. The officer informed us that he had received a number of calls from the motorists who said that they had nearly crashed into a motorcycle that was travelling without lights on. When we told the officer that the lights had packed up on the journey, he kindly phoned a breakdown truck which picked us up and took us the rest of the way. Fortunately, he didn't ask to see what was in my pockets. He was one of the nicest policemen I have met. I guess he could have saved my life. Perhaps someone up there knew I had work to do and that work involved staying alive. Probably the one notable achievement of my time in Sunderland was that I passed my driving test. I borrowed the money off Claire and was lucky enough to pass the test second time. I don't know how I passed, as smoking cannabis does nothing for your memory and every time I got back in the driver instructor's car it was a bit like getting in for my first lesson. I do remember I would book my lessons for first thing in the morning so I would not be so stoned. My driving instructor seemed oblivious to my bloodshot eyes. He was more interested in getting me to pull over to show me his most recent batch of photos of scantily dressed women he had taken. Perhaps it's a northeastern approach to driving instruction. Another thing I learnt in Sunderland was that I was insecure. Hardly surprising, I guess, considering my childhood, but in those days I viewed it as a weakness, as I had no understanding of how childhood would affect the way we think and feel and act as an adult. My relationship with Claire was stormy. I was certainly more dependent on her than she was on me. Every time she went away to see her mother or visit friends, I would experience tremendous feelings of abandonment and fear. I would find myself doing my best to anaesthetise these feelings with extra quantities of cannabis, but the feelings were so strong that even this did not work. I was jealous and controlling, and probably not much fun to be around at all most of the time. Claire was no angel either, another victim of a dysfunctional childhood. She was messed up and unpredictable. I was woken abruptly one morning as she dived onto the bed wielding a pair of scissors uncannily close to my face and screaming like a banshee. I can't remember what it was all about, but I probably deserved it. Odd incidents like this broke the monotony of the days in Sunderland, which were becoming increasingly predictable and grey. Claire's free spirit was hard to keep up with at times, and one day she announced she was going to go on holiday to Turkey. She wasn't in the habit of asking my opinion, and once she decided something, that was it. I had no money as usual, and if I was to go with her, I would have to come up with a plan and some cash fast. Sunderland was not an easy place to find work, so again I was forced to set off in search of it. Previously, I worked for an old Irish builder in Oxford, so I rang him up to see if he had any labouring work for me. Fortunately he did, and I headed down. By this time my parents were living in Spain, and I lived in a tent on a campsite outside Oxford while I worked there. It was a long walk into town and back each day, as I had no transport, and I remember what a lonely time it was. But there is a stubborn side to me, and when I decide that I'm going to do something, I generally see it through. Resilience, determination and perseverance are qualities that were probably beginning to develop within me at this time and they were well needed for the challenges that were to come. The so-called holiday in Turkey was no picnic. It began with a severe case of diarrhoea. 
I was confined to the hostel for a couple of days after finding that every short walk would result in an undignified shuffle back to the hostel to shower and change my underwear. When I did get out and about to explore the country, it was severely impacted by the fact that Claire insisted on wearing vest t-shirts and short skirts. This was not a good idea in a Muslim country. I constantly felt under threat as I did my best to discourage the Arab men from leering and touching my girlfriend at every opportunity and this made hitchhiking rather challenging and stressful too. We decided to have a gentle tour on horseback. At least this was what we thought we were paying for. On the morning of the tour, a man arrived with two huge horses and indicated that we were free to set off on our own. Neither of us had ridden before, but being young and reckless, we decided there couldn't be too much to it. We set off up the road into the mountains. Because of the short skirt factor, the lorries that drove past kept blasting their horns and scaring the horses. Claire was already pretty nervous on her horse, and before long she had been thrown off into the ditch. Insisting that it was the fault of her horse, we swapped horses. It wasn't long after we had decided to get off the road and follow some old tracks that she was again thrown from her horse. This time she landed badly, sprained her ankle, and her horse galloped off over the hill. All of a sudden, what had seemed like a good idea had turned into a bit of a disaster. I held Claire to the shade of a tree and rode off to try and retrieve the runaway horse, reassuring her that I would soon be back. It wasn't too long before I caught up with Claire's horse. It was in the middle of the main road, causing quite a hold-up. Eventually, after a game of chase, I managed to grab hold of its reins and made my way back to where Claire was waiting in the shade of the tree. We slowly made our way back down to the town in search of medical assistance for Claire's ankle. The medics were very helpful on the whole, apart from a porter who insisted on staring unashamedly up her skirt while the doctor bandaged her ankle. It was not the best holiday I had ever had, and I was glad to get back to England. Not long after I left Sunderland, I had an unusual encounter with a glass blower. I don't remember all the details, but I think I was in Durham, and for some reason I was looking around a working museum. One of the crafts that made up the displays was glass blowing. I remember asking the craftsman if he had made glass pipes, which were particularly fashionable for smoking cannabis at the time. He told me that he did not, and for some reason I asked him if he smoked. He gave me a knowing look, and told me that he didn't any more. When I asked why, he just said, you'll have to work that one out for yourself. I pressed him further, but he would say no more, and I left, and for some reason that brief exchange had always stayed with me. Indeed, in time, I did find out for myself why it was not a good idea to be constantly stoned, but it did take a while. It took a while before the drugs wouldn't work any more, before the numbness was overridden by the pressure within to release the pain of my past. The time would come when I would have to begin to face my demons, and somehow it was as if the glass blower knew this. By the time Claire had finished her degree, I was ready to get out of Sunderland. We had been to a few festivals over the summer, and with some money that she inherited, she decided to buy an old Leyland FG bread lorry. It was already converted to live in, and as neither of us had seen much of Scotland, we decided to head north on a tour around the Scottish coast. When I look back, I see that my life has been a little bit like stepping stones in the mist, and heading for Scotland in an old truck just seemed to be the right thing to do. The opportunity arose, and I took it. Although for most of my life I have had no clear goal of where I am going, I feel as if something has been guiding me, and it is up to me to have faith, not focus too far ahead, and just take the next step. Often I am not sure what the next step is, or where it will lead, but when the time is right, I find that the mist clears and the next stepping stone appears for me to step onto. There have been times when I've been impatient for the mist to clear. Sometimes the mist clears unexpectedly and I do not feel ready to take the next step, but I have learnt to trust. I'm reminded of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's words. When you come to the end of all the light you know and are about to step into the darkness of the unknown, faith is knowing that one of two things will happen. There will be something solid to stand on, or you will be taught to fly. So far, there's always been something solid to stand on, and I believe that one day, when I am ready, 
I will take a step and I shall learn to fly. But for now, I shall continue on my stepping stones. Perhaps the last stepping stone will lead me to death, or perhaps there is no last stepping stone. Only time will tell. Lessons for life. Life is full of lessons when we open our eyes and ears and are receptive. Often the lessons are highlighted through synchronicity or meaningful chance encounters. Lesson two. There are many good people in the world and regardless of past experiences, one should be open to this truth. Lesson three. Human beings have a fundamental need to belong. Lesson four. Every decision or action I make today will impact on all of my tomorrows.